Uh, we have traveled some, and I've tried to take my kids to places that I never got to go, and what an adventure it has been. If I could put my finger on one adventure that is memorable, uh, it, would, it would be in Wales. Uh, one of our family trips was a two-week stay in Wales, and among the highlights, as you might expect, were medieval castles uh, that just um, injected you with chivalry. Uh, the, the sandy beaches there, uh, right under those uh, green pastured cliffs, sometimes white cliffs, were just breathtaking. And then uh, at times, in order to get to some of these beaches, you would have to uh, walk across these bridges, suspended. Now, I am terribly afraid of heights. <laughs> Uh, so uh, oftentimes my wife was far more brave than I could, I could be. But uh, some of these bridges were just right on the water. And you would walk across, uh, covered on both sides by uh, water lilies. And uh, I, I had a friend once who used to tell me, he was Welsh, used to tell me, well, of course, Wales is God's country after all. And maybe there's truth to that. Maybe there's truth to that. My favorite memory, though, has to do with a site well off the beaten path in a, a little town called Pembrokeshire, sandwiched between two giant rocks, sitting halfway down this th steep limestone cliff. You'll find a chapel, a very old chapel, and it is built out of rock and built into the cleft of the rock. The chapel is named after Saint Govan, a sixth century monk who lived in a cave. Now, there's lots of legend that surrounds this monk, making it sometimes difficult to know truth from fiction. But that aside, one legend has it that he was on the run from pirates when the cliff swallowed him up into safety until the pirates passed by. And he remained on that cliff really for the rest of his life, lived as a hermit, but would come out occasionally to assist those who lived nearby to warn them if he saw pirates on their way in. Now, regardless of whether the story is true or not, I can't tell you, maybe it is, but we do know that in the 11th century, so fast forward here, in the 11th century, this chapel was built on this same site, and some say his bones are still buried beneath the chapel. Well, we just had to descend down this cliff. Uh, it, it was a bit scary. The, the steps were steep, and the wind was rushing by us. And we were careful not to trip, especially with little kids, but we made it. 52 steps are lodged between those two towering cliffs. And as I went down those steps, I tried to imagine what must it have, what, what was it like for him to escape those deadly pirates that day, running for his life? Well, he hid himself in the, in the rock. Why? Because the rock acted as a fortress. And because it was in the cleft of the rock, the ships that threatened him could not get in, or they would be smashed by the waves up against those cliffy mountains. But not only did it hide him from plain sight, it protected him. It protected him from the winds, the waves of the sea, which have which would have not just crushed any ship, but him as well. No doubt, as he hid there in the rock, much like Moses hiding in the cleft of the rock, he would have felt both afraid and safe. Isn't that a paradox? Afraid, yet safe. And here I was, hundreds and hundreds of years later, same rock, underneath my feet. And that opening line 
from that hymn, Rock of Ages, by Augustus Toplady. It buzzed in my ear. I couldn't get it out. Maybe you know it. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. This imagery of the rock conveys many things, doesn't it? But most vivid of all is the concept of its immutable nature. Wars come, wars go, countries rise and fall, and all the world changes one century after another. But not the rock. It's still there. It's not thwarted. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in a small way, that rock tells us something about God. Because he does not change. He never fluctuates. He's firm and secure, always there, incapable of defeat, and forever steadfast as a fortress to those in trouble. Well, long before St. Govan fled from those pirates, David fled from King Saul. Maybe you remember the story. Filled with envy, Saul tracked David relentlessly, like an assassin on a mission to eliminate his target. How scary that must have been for David. Fleeing for his life, David turned where? Time and time again, he went into the caves, hidden deep in the heart of the earth and the heart of the rock. Because it was there that Saul could not penetrate. And on one occasion, David praises the Lord. In 2 Samuel 22, he praises the Lord for delivering him from his enemies, including Saul. And this is what he sings, verse 2 and 3 and verse 32. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It's not just here. Repeatedly in the Psalms, David addresses God as his rock. This is a title that identifies where the source of his assurance and salvation is to be found. This is Psalm 62, verse 2 and 7. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. We won't take time to look at all the Psalms, but if you were to continue, if you were to do a study of the different Psalms, Psalm 19, for example, you will also discover that David uses this term rock to, to so identify who God is, it becomes a proper name for God. He begins and ends his prayers exclaiming, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Notice those two words go together. Rock, Redeemer. Why does David do this? David sees an inseparable connection between God's character and real life. God's immutable, unchanging essence or being is the very foundation of David's trust in God for salvation, both physical and spiritual. If God is, is not unchanging like a rock, then he cannot act as David's fortress in times of turmoil. But if God is a, a God who does not change, then David has every reassurance that he can run to God 
when the whole earth has given way under his feet. Maybe you have had that experience as well. But it's not just here, is it, where we see God's immutability. Many other passages, including the New Testament, affirm this same attribute, so essential to who God is. We don't have time, but maybe tonight go home and read Malachi 3.6 or James, James 1.17, and you will see this attribute shine through in all kinds of ways. Let me ask you a theological question. What would happen if God were subject to change? Variation in God would spell the death of his own perfection. Remember that word? No longer would he be someone than whom none greater can be conceived. Think about this for a minute. If he were to change for, be for the better, that would imply that he was less than perfect beforehand. There was some type of deficiency or imperfection in his being. If he were to change for the worse, that would imply that he was perfect, but no longer is perfect. An imperfection has been added to him, or a perfection in him has been lost. And so he must change either from better or worse or worse to better. Well, either option, God ceases to be eternally good. A God who is not eternally good is not eternally perfect either. And a God who is not eternally perfect cannot be God in the end. Immutability, we have to conclude, is essential and necessary to God's identity as the perfect, supreme being. But we should also add another point. If God changed from good to better, we would also have to ask what perfection was lacking. His wisdom, his power, his knowledge, his love. We might also ask whether God is at the mercy of such a change or if such a change is voluntary. If he were at the mercy of such a change, then God would be impotent, vulnerable to the will of something or someone else, no longer the most sovereign king, no longer the most supreme being. On the other hand, what if, his, what if this change was voluntary? God would be at odds with himself, for he would, he would have willed a change in his very being, even though his perfections deny change, at least as long as they are to remain perfections. He would have willed that his perfections become less than perfect. Consider one example of this. If God is the most omnipotent, all-powerful being, then he wills that he no longer be the most omnipotent being, then God has changed not only his power, but the perfection of his power. No longer is he, no longer is his power supreme. And a power that is not supreme in the divine being in God cannot be a perfect power, for it is now susceptible to the power and will of another. Well, we, you could choose any attribute, couldn't you? Point is, whatever attribute you choose, each one must be characterized by his immutability if it is to remain perfect. This is just a, a bit of a footnote here. But when you study the attributes of God, we finite creatures, we have to go one at a time, don't we? We just looked at God's infinitude in the last hour. Now we're, we're switching gears to look at his immutability. But don't don't let, that, don't let that tempt you. Don't let that make you think that somehow these are not related to each other. In fact, in one sense, we could say they're all identical with another. How can we describe one without the other? His immutability is infinite in measure. His holiness is immutable. His love is immutable, and so on. They are all connected, inseparable, as long as God is one. Now, I claimed earlier that a perfect being is a being without limitations. That's what it means to be perfect, after all. Or we could put it positively and say it means he is infinite. But if change is introduced to God, something new in God, 
Well, that implies some perfection was lacking that has now been gained. Change must be a limitation. I love what uh, Thomas Aquinas, also on that A team I mentioned earlier, I love what he says. But since God is infinite, comprehending in himself all the plenitude of the perfection of all being, he cannot acquire anything new. What he's trying to say is this, an infinite, perfect being cannot be the receiver of some new perfection, but must always be the source of all perfection. Think about that. If God were the receiver rather than the source, then he would be dependent on something outside himself for his completion, for his fulfillment. He would no longer be self-sufficient. If God is not this changing God, this God who's becoming something else, but if he is one who remains the same, then he is a God who does not have potential. Potential implies deficiency in some way. Now, we use the word potential in all kinds of ways, don't we? Oh, Johnny's got great potential to be a receiver. Or Jill has great potential to be a center one day on a basketball team. But what does that imply? It implies there's work to be done. It implies that as great as that athlete may be, there's still something missing. But they have the potential to reach completion or perfection in our own standards. But God is not someone who needs perfecting, is he? He's not perfectible. He is eternally, immutably perfect. And his perfection is infinite in measure. He is, as I said before, the fullness of being. And as one who is eternally, immutably, infinite, perfect, he is not someone who has or must reach his potential. Potential would mean he needs to grow in his perfection. And growth like this would imply he is not perfect, at least not yet, but hopes to become so. He hopes to one day reach his potential. But, by contrast, if God is the perfect being, well, then he is perfection itself. Many of the members of that A-team, they have a a two-word phrase that tries to capture everything we just said. It's always wise to have a two-word phrase to capture such complex truths, isn't it? They used this phrase and said, God is pure act. Pure act. Now, why would they use that phrase? Well, if God is pure act, that's one way of saying he has no, he's not passive. He has no passive potential, or what they like to call potency. He has no passive potency. Now, I realize these are uh, terms we don't use every day, but hang with me. Passive potency means there's something in need of being activated. Something that needs to be fulfilled. And if you apply that to God, goodness, what would that mean for God? There's something in need of being fulfilled in God. Something that makes him still incomplete if he doesn't have it. But when we look at Scripture, we don't see that, do we? Nothing needs to be activated in God. As if he were in need of becoming, of becoming something more than he already is for all eternity. Now, he is pure act itself. He is life in the most absolute sense. Life in and of himself, needing nothing. So, what that means is denying that there's potential in God, this passive potency, as we said. Well, that's just a fancy way of 
of making sure that we do our biblical due diligence to keep the creator distinct from the, cre from the creature. He is not a God whose parts must be activated like ours, as if they're full of potential, if only they could reach their potential, incomplete, but never, nevertheless with the ability to be affected and perhaps someday get there. If that were true, well, in God's case, he would be affected, changed, perhaps even hurt by those in creation. But the God of the Bible is not a weak God. He's, he's, not, vul, he's not vulnerable to be pitied, which is why it's so wise to say of him, he is pure act. This phrase conveys that God is not acted on, but is the one who acts on others. Now, if this is true, and if we should call him by these names, then it comes back to the very basic principle that the earliest thinkers have, have turned to, and it's this. God is the unmoved mover. Everything in our world, as you look around, you look at your daily life, everything in our world is mutable. It changes. It's moved by something or someone else. And if we were to trace that back as far as possible, every action you make, every event in your life, we would discover that there never was a moment when you were not moved by something or someone. My point is, our ever-changing universe that, that we live in, well, it's full of movers always being moved, isn't it? But where did that chain of moved movers begin? Better question yet, how did it begin? That chain cannot be infinite, for if it were, then we would not be able to explain our movement at all. But what if there is someone who explains all of this? Well, he would have to be unchanging himself. The mover who is unmoved for all eternity. The only one that can create all the movement and changing that you see. You remember back to that prayer of Augustine? Is, do you remember what he said? He said in his prayer, God changes all things, moves all things, but he himself is changed by no one. Simple prayer, isn't it? That's the idea. And so when we use words like pure, act, or immutability, I know that sounds really weird, right? We don't talk that way in church usually. Maybe it's uber philosophical, but it's also very helpful when we have to dig deep into the deep things of God. It's trying to communicate that God cannot acquire anything new as if he was lacking before. His perfection does not increase or decrease. He never needs to become more perfect than he already is. One individual put it this way, God is a being without becoming. So different from us. The God who is pure act has in and of himself all the plentitude of perfection of being. That's a, maybe a very philosophical way of saying this God does not change. Now, I've been mentioning a lot of older names like Augustine, but I want to introduce you to one of my favorites, a Puritan, Stephen Charnock. Because Charnock helps us see how to connect the dots between everything we just said and all the other attributes of God, as well as the Christian life. Immutability is not just central to a correct understanding of God's very identity, but it also proves indispensable to your understanding of every other attribute you learn about God. This is why Stephen Charnock, this Puritan, he said, there's a sense in which immutability is the 
enamel. The enamel that, almost like a glue, helps us to keep in our mind together all the different attributes of God. He calls immutability the glory that belongs to all the attributes, where they all unite. And he says at one point, without immutability, everything else would come undone. Now, I I want you to see this. We don't have time to explore the countless ways we see this. In my book, None Greater, I, I look at seven, seven different ways you see this with, and I argue that, well, it's because God does not change that he is self-sufficient. It's because God does not change that he is a God without parts. It's because God does not change that he's all-knowing and all-wise. It's because God does not change that he's not restricted like we are by time and space. It's because he doesn't change that he actually can remain holy and just. And it's because he does not change that he is a God of love. But for the sake of time, I want to just look at one or two. And I want you to to see, to connect the dots here and, and see how immutability is so illuminating to your understanding of all of God. Let's focus on an attribute or two that no doubt you hear a lot about and you're familiar with, God's holiness and his justice. Can God be holy and just if he is a God who changes? Well, a God who is mutable in holiness, that could be the scariest thought of all. Holiness is the the dividing line between God and the devil. If holiness can be or not be in God, we no longer know for certain if the God we worship will do that which is right. For instance, consider how horrifying it would be if God's just character changed. A God who changes in his justice is liable to prosecution in our human courtroom. A judge who does not rule justly according to the law, is considered either corrupt or negligent. And either one can result in such a judge being placed behind bars. Now, if this is true of our human, very fallible courtroom, how much more true is it of God, who is by definition holy? Should he change in his justice, his own holiness would be suspect. Imagine if he punished the wicked one day only to turn a blind eye to their criminal actions and approve of their wickedness the next. What we see in Scripture is very different, isn't it? You think of a passage like Deuteronomy 32 where Moses sings that God, who he says is our rock, he says his work is perfect for all his ways are justice. Moses goes on to say a God of faithfulness, a God without iniquity, just and upright is he. When God's immutability and his justice collide with one another, so do other attributes. If God's justice is unchanging, then so is his knowledge. For an immutable justice demands that God never forget the sins of the wicked. Isn't that what Hosea says in chapter 7? Or an immutable justice requires immutable goodness and love. Listen to what Stephen Charnock says. Goodness is always the object of his love. And wickedness is always the object of his hatred. His aversion to sin never changes It never grows lax. Let me just say this very practically. As you look out at the world and you see all the problems that are there, the suffering, the evil, 
the lack of hope. And here you are trusting God Sunday after Sunday. And you look out and it looks like what? The wicked are prospering. Where does your hope lie? Do you have hope anymore? Where do you go in that moment? It'll be dark. Where do you go? Where do you find assurance? How do you keep going in life? Maybe the wickedness or the suffering is even in your life. Maybe it's been done to you or your family or your friends. Where do you go? How do you keep going? Friends, the only hope in those moments, those dark moments, is God's immutability. If he is not immutable, you have no assurance that his justice will reign in the end. Because sometimes, right now, according to our eyes and our sight, what we see is visible, it doesn't look like it. But we are told again and again and again in Scripture, God does not change. Therefore, stand firm. Therefore, the wicked will be judged. Therefore, God will raise you in the end. Or consider love. Jonathan Edwards tells us that it's because God is an infinite being as well as an all-sufficient being that he must be an infinite fountain of love. But it's also because he is unchangeable and eternal that he is an eternal fountain of love. Don't miss this. God, if he is this eternal fountain of love from which you draw on day by day, such love reflects the character of his own love for himself. It's because God loves himself without change that his love for us is a love that does not change. Should his love for himself fluctuate, there would be little assurance for you that his love will remain steadfast. Can you imagine if God's love were not immutable? Salvation would be the first doctrine to go, wouldn't it? What assurance would we have in his gracious, benevolent election of us before the foundation of the world? It's only because God's love is immutable, an immutable love, that we can rest assured that God chose us prior to creation and he will turn us into new creatures, guard us from the evil one so that one day we enjoy his new creation. It's because of his love that he, he is eternally immutable. It's because of all this that we sing, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Do you know the rest? For his steadfast love. His what? His steadfast, steadfast, steadfast love endures forever. This is a phrase that is sung by the psalmist again and again. I don't know about you, but I waver in my experience of God's love. One day, not feeling it as much as the day before. Maybe you do too. So let me ask you a question again. Where do you turn? When your experience is all over the place, changing. Our assurance is not based on our feelings. 
Rather, it rests in a love that never changes. The Father's love for us, hear this, the Father's love for you is as unchanging as his love for his own son. Most Sunday afternoons, I, if I can, I really enjoy escaping and diving into a, a good biography. I love biographies. I lose myself in them. My wife has to call me back to reality. Uh, my favorite biographies, though, are about, they're not the biographies that are pristine and neat and tidy and not those. My favorite biographies are about Christians who, well, things have been tough, messy even. They've endured much, perhaps, for the gospel. Not because they are confidently triumphalistic. Actually, it's, it's for very different reasons. They're transparent about their absolute dependence on God. Sometimes in the midst of nearly giving up. Often, they they'll point to the little things that they can look back on now after a whole life lived. The little things that God used to keep them from going, going the wrong direction or giving up. Maybe some of these you know well. A friend, a church member, their persistent prayers for you. Uh, a spouse, maybe their quiet faithfulness in the midst of your loud uh, rebellion. Maybe the warning, these are the hardest, aren't they? The warning of a close friend to keep you from sin, from slipping. The author of Hebrews knew that these little means, there's many more, these little means, well, they're absolutely key to the Christian life which is why the book of Hebrews is filled with all those warnings about apostasy, some of them very severe. It not only warn, warns us, though, it also comforts us, pointing us to the immutable character of a holy God for assurance in times of testing. If you want to guarantee something, guarantee the truthfulness or reliability, say, of a, a promise you've made, what do you do? Well, you'll likely swear on the most personal, the most significant, the most valuable object you have, if the stakes are high enough, I suppose. Maybe this is why we say something like, I swear on my mother's grave, right? We're trying to communicate. There's nothing greater to swear on here for you to trust that I'll do what I said. We know, uh, well, as human beings, we're prone to lie, aren't we? We're prone to change our mind, to be fickle. So if we're to be trusted, we must swear by the character of something or someone else that's greater than ourselves. This reassures the other person. They'll keep their word. But God doesn't have to do this like us. He has... Nothing greater to swear by than himself. Never changing his holiness, he is the very standard of justice and morality in the universe. In a court of law, it used to be the case that one had to place their hand on the Bible, swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, truth so help me God. But if God, let's just pretend here, were to step up and enter the witness stand, he would have nowhere to place his hand but on his own chest. Why is that? Well, in order to reassure, you think of a book like Hebrews again, Hebrews 6, in order to reassure his readers that they too are children of the promises of Abraham, the author of Hebrews turns to God's own nature, his own character to do so. Listen to this. He says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no, no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, 
saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge, that sound familiar? Might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is before us. Whether or not God's oath on which our entire salvation depends is reliable depends entirely on his unchanging nature. His holy, immutable character. Whether all the covenant promises will be yours rests not only on God's faithfulness to the covenant, but on the unchanging nature of God himself. Knowing he is this immutably holy God, one who does not change and therefore will not lie, the Christian, you have every reason to flee to God for refuge, especially in that hour of trial. And this side of the empty tomb, isn't this what Hebrews says in Hebrews 13? The soul's sure and steadfast anchor is found in no one else but who? Jesus Christ, the one who is the same yesterday and today and what? Forever. He stepped into the very presence of God, into the inner place behind the curtain of the temple. Old Testament imagery coming through here, offering up an eternal sacrifice for our sins as our eternal high priest, as our immutable mediator. Do you see where your salvation, where your assurance is to be found? At the start, I told you that story about the rocks and descending the cliffs and that hymn, Rock of Ages. Couldn't get it out of my head. But I didn't quote all of it. In light of Hebrews 6, it makes a lot of sense to quote the rest of it to you. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Let's pray.